to say that, I mean, the very uh, fact that you have chosen such a, such a topic suggests, and to say it explicitly that democracy faces a crisis, not just in India but elsewhere, is to state a very self-evident truth. Okay? It's, uh, it's not just in India, but a particularly sharp crisis in India. Otherwise, you can see it across the world unfolding in many different ways. And what are those, what are those different crises? How are they being confronted by the Indian people? Um, generally, even even just three four days ago, when I'm when I'm invited to speak on a public platform, immediately people expect me and want me to speak about the rural crisis or the agrarian crisis. I want to say a couple of things about that. The crisis we are in is no longer just rural. It's national. And you can't separate these different strands of crisis. Second, <coughs> crisis has gripped the nation as a whole. Crisis has gripped its very soul. Now this idea of the, the fights over democracy preserving it, attacking it. <clears throat> we can discuss them in the post-truth era or post-liberalization era. However, these two dramatically opposed views of democracy go back quite a bit in our history as an independent nation. And you should know that the founders of the Indian constitution had this very debate on the floor of the constituent assembly. Two completely opposed views of what democracy was. In, on November 25th, in fact, when Dr. Ambedkar handed over the constitution, draft of the constitution to the Constituent Assembly, November 25th, 1949, Ambedkar said, I do so in some trepidation. Today we enter a world of contradictions. In politics there is equality. In social and economic life there is no equality. In politics there is, I'm paraphrasing, in, now, I'm paraphrasing. The first was verbatim. In politics, there is democracy. In social and economic life, there is no democracy. And the lack of equality in the latter will one day, the tension around the lack of equality in society and economy will one day explode the fine edifice of democracy that this assembly has so assiduously built up. I believe a truer word was never said in an Indian legislative forum. Okay. He warned that in politics, we treat it as one man, one vote, one value. Those were his words. But not in society and not in economy. One individual is not the same as another in society not the same in economy. In other words, I, in my reckoning, and I have read a bit on the background, that was the greatest speech on inequality and justice ever made in an Indian legislative forum. <coughs> Today you're confronted with that situation. From 91, you've built the most unequal India the greatest inequality that has existed since, say, 1921-1922, at the height of the British Raj, at the height of a British Raj victorious in World War I. That kind of inequality we have begun to see. In fact, 
the difference between inequality in the first 50 years of independence and in the last 20 or 25 is this. From 1950, from 1956 onwards, if you take the Congress Party's Avadi session in Tamil Nadu, down to 1980s, economic inequality or income inequality actually declined in India. It declined. Then from the 80s, as late as we get into the first time India gets into an IMF loan, into World Bank loans, that situation begins to change. Then in 90s, and what makes the present inequality completely different from any other inequality that existed after 1947, was that inequality was constructed by policy driven, conceived of as a strategy which neoliberal economists call trickle-down theory. So you actually construct policy to concentrate wealth at the top so that some of it trickles down. The most discredited theory in economic philosophy anywhere in the world but we brought it in. India has a genius for bringing in something which has tried and failed everywhere else and celebrating it as if it's a personal discovery of the Prime Minister, whoever is the Prime Minister at that time. So you have this uh, never in our history as an independent nation was inequality so cynically constructed, so ruthlessly engineered by policy, making a virtue of inequality that competitiveness is necessary, you know, and we are a democracy and liberty is, our for, is at the forefront of our thinking. Actually, another thing Ambedkar said in that speech, liberty without, e liberty without equality, Liberty without equality allows for the supremacy of a few over the multitudes. He said, do not try separating these concepts, liberty, equality, fraternity. They are inextricably and integrally connected. Don't try, you cannot have one without the other two. You try that, you are going to make a mess of your constitution. Okay. I, uh, so you have five days after Ambedkar makes his speech, a magazine puts out the alternative view and that dispute is being played out today. You need to know this. You need to know where you came from to have a sense of where you're going. Five days after Ambedkar made what was undoubtedly the finest speech on democracy and inequality in an Indian legislative forum, an editorial appeared in an English magazine by people who detest the English language. <coughs> it said, there is not an iota of anything that is Bharatiya in this constitution. It is a bunch of plagiarized, fragmented, lifted stuff from constitutions of the US, Irish, UK and half a dozen other places. It has no spirit of Indianness in it. Okay? It trashed the Indian constitution, it trashed every founding principle that the Constituent Assembly addressed. It called for the replacement of this ridiculous nonsense of the constitution with the Manusmriti. You know, that tome of equality and justice. It called for the replacement of your constitution with the Manusmriti. Those were the two contending views of the time. 
guess which one is in power today hmm? in fact no prizes for guessing yeah that was an edit that was the position of the organizer magazine of the rashtriya swayamsevak sam more debates took place and you will find something else also very interesting the same people who trashed your constitution trashed the national flag and the national anthem okay the national flag the tiranga and the let's take the national anthem today we have laws compelling all of you to stand maybe who knows how many times a day and sing it i personally think that the indian national anthem is a beautiful anthem and i'm sorry that your generation has been deprived you, well the biggest crime committed against you is that we have robbed you of your history okay but what two generations have been deprived of is the full janagana mana tagore's janagana mana was longer it is a protest song it speaks of it speaks of the noblest values of we picked the cherry picked the few verses we liked which are not bad i like them and we sing those but please go back today google it up look for the full unabridged song of tagore tagore was viciously attacked by those who attacked the constitutional draft of ambedkar tagore was viciously attacked he was called a tout and lover of the british empire it was said they people wrote articles saying and pamphlets that this is actually a paean of praise to the british emperor rabindranath tagore gurudev was a man who never reacted in anger or in passion to criticism but he was so hurt that he actually put pen to paper on this in an interview and rebutted the thing and said this is about the soul of this country it's about it's about the soul of our people so they trashed the constitution then they trashed the national anthem a little later the tiranga was trashed the tiranga was given out bashing saying that well basically the objection to the tiranga was that little green strip over there right that was irritating to them and of course uh as late as the early 90s or early in the early 90s i remember in, i used to work in a tabloid called the blitz and every republic day and independence day we would have a special issue of people who went back to the freedom struggle generation and one of those was the ideologue k r malkani whom i liked very much as an individual as a human being very nice person and when i asked him to write for it he wrote a piece so this is as late as the 90s talking about this ridiculous flag of ours which should be replaced with the bhagwa with the with the saffron one now what a journey you have made that those who trashed the constitution the anthem and the flag are today its champions jailing and imprisoning and exiling and externing those who have been with the with those national symbols all along okay so this is your this is the place we are in uh but i wanted to say that this crisis a do not think that it started last year do not think that it started in 2014 that is however much i may like or dislike a regime that would be historically a lie 
and it would be untrue and unfair analytically incorrect to suggest that the crisis you face began in 2014 that is not so the crisis was there for a very long time but taken to a new level and accelerated from a bunch of policies that we followed with a vengeance from 1991 your ambedkar said it liberty without democracy in the social and economic spheres leads to the supremacy of a few over the many of a very few over the many your greatest crisis well we can talk about the rural the agrarian I'll, i want to say another thing about the agrarian crisis having covered it for 25 years for the last 5 years i have been insisting the agrarian crisis has gone far beyond the agrarian it's no longer just restricted to agrarian society it is no longer just about loss of productivity loss of employment the tragic loss of human lives in 315000 farmers suicides incredibly sad i was the guy who covered those stories and i'm telling you that it's gone beyond that the agrarian crisis is no longer agrarian it is a societal crisis you know perhaps it is a civilizational crisis when the largest body of small holders small landowners in the planet are fighting for the very survival and dropping out of agriculture at the rate of 2000 a day on average for the last 20 years you are talking about a civilizational crisis how will this not affect your democracy i i i'm saying it's like ambedkar almost laid down an iron law of democracy and we are seeing it unfold today whatever he said in that speech every day in my i encounter what he said in that speech he saw very clearly because he saw it from the perspective of the marginalized or from the perspective of the underdog and that's what's happening today if if we care to look the agrarian crisis is more than that the, the crisis is also not just a civilizational one i think it's a moral one it's a crisis of our morality of our moral issue, of our moral standing of our integrity and intellect hmm. because look when 315000 human beings from a single occupation have taken their lives in 20 years and we have accepted it where is the great outrage has any one of us expressed that outrage in some form that is meaningful we were okay with it we were all upset about it we all clicked our tongues when we said this should not be and and, and then it was life as usual business as usual we have accepted it i think it's not just about a loss of jobs and a loss of productivity but a loss of our own humanity okay we need to we need to think about that the greatest of these crises and i'm talking about several now employment education perhaps well let's take education we are in an educational institution i think that here i will say uh, i i i will make one qualification to what i said earlier the crisis has been on for 28 29 years okay in in its present contours but there's been a huge acceleration in the last 6 years a dramatic escalation in the last 6 years and what has that done to ordinary people and their access to justice the extension of the cow slaughter ban the demonetization the 
um, the GST, the tax, what has all this done to these people? What has it done to the people whom, of whom Ambedkar was speaking in his final presentation in the Constituent Assembly? Hmm? Take education, the kind of stuff that you're having in education. Uh, the kind of stuff that you're having in education, the previous, the previous uh, MOS, Minister of State, my old acquaintance from Mumbai, Satyapal Singh Ji, he was my police commissioner in Mumbai, he was also police commissioner Pune, and then he was Minister of State for Education in uh, the central government for five years. If we just look at the top, you can look at what's happening to education. Five years, Mr. Satyapal Singh made his single mission, the discrediting of Charles Darwin and Darwin's theory. Though by you, there were a couple of things on which I agreed with him. He made about 70 speeches on with this theme of Darwin said that man is descended from the ape. Actually, Darwin did not say that for God's sake. Darwin spoke about a common ancestor. He didn't say man is descended from the ape. But never mind. That was Satyapal Singh Ji's understanding of Darwin's theory. This is your minister for education. Hmm. He understood Darwin's theory to say that man is descended from the ape. Then uh, he made the... Though in all this, there were two things that I agreed with him. And not just because he was my old police commissioner. One is, in science, nobody is beyond question. Not Darwin, not Einstein, not anybody. Nobody is beyond question. I, there would not have been an Einstein or a Darwin if they had practiced the philosophy that some, some other great figure was beyond question. Yeah. If you had a present day Einstein living, he would be challenging the theory of Einstein. So I agree with Satyapal ji that, yeah, you don't have to, uh, you know, blindly accept. That's the antithesis of science, if you blindly accept. The other thing he said, his, his punchline sentence was, nobody has gone into the forest and watched apes turn into men. I agree with that, though you might find it disputed by a couple of leaders of the Bajrang Dal. I agree that nobody has gone into the forest and uh, watched apes turn into men, but we live in privileged times when we were witness to Satyapalji and half his fellow cabinet members, government mem ministers, attempt the reverse process with some degree of success. Hmm. So you have you have that level of anti-intellect, anti-education occupying the highest levels of government. We had a meeting at the inaugural of the, uh, it had to be, Ambani uh, Health Foundation or whatever, where the Prime Minister of this country argued that there was, not argue, he stated firmly, that ancient Indians knew cosmetic, I mean, knew plastic surgery and genetic engineering and stem cell engineering and offered as evidence the existence of Lord Ganesha with an elephant's head and uh, the birth of Karna. <coughs> then you had uh, the appoint, I mean, this was at the ministerial level. We also had an HRD minister, another HRD minister, whose degree credentials we have never been able to fathom because it changes in every electoral affidavit. We are not even sure that she completed her high school. Okay. We don't know. Yeah. One of my favorite, and then that's not just restricted to that minister. Please which is the greatest mystery of a degree in this country. In the CAA protests at the August Kranti Maidan, which is a historic ground in Indian freedom struggle in Mumbai, 
my favorite poster was a young young uh, young girl maybe 21 holding a poster addressed to the prime minister i'll show you my documents if you show me your degree okay so you now i am one of those who believes that the protests on across the country are not just about the citizenship amendment act i think i was i was at the august kranti i attended several of the meetings at the august kranti maidan we couldn't get in so strong was the crowd i stood on a very high wall which had a very high fence and two three of us were clinging on too many people were clinging on i didn't know when the fence would come down and we looked pretty ridiculous up there but everybody could spot us so many many students came up spoke to us took signatures or autographs or whatever on their books i asked why are you here so many of them one of the things that i noticed about the meetings nobody was listening to the speakers there's a reason because people came there to be seen to say we are here we are with you we are with them we are we, we want to be seen we are we want to be seen and how what did they want to be seen on they wanted to be seen in defense of that constitution that ambedkar handed over that day on november 25th whether the protesters articulated that way or not and another group that i asked what are you doing here they said so we are here in support and solidarity of our muslim brothers sisters and neighbors and classmates because they are being targeted and it's against the constitution of this country that day it was very obvious that the different protesters there were 40 from that high point you could see 40 50 different groups with drums guitars everybody having their own time and the speakers were going on which very good speakers mind you i wanted to listen to them but there was no chance with that much sound um at that moment it was so obvious that whether the young people there were aware of it or not whether they were articulating it that way or not whether they understand it that way or not they were there defending the most basic principles of a republican constitutional democracy liberty equality and fraternity the very things that ambedkar said are inseparable if we are to build a nation okay those young people were doing precisely that and that was something fantastic though now i will say i'm very glad all of you are reading out the preamble of the constitution can i invite you to read a little bit more of the constitution there's a chapter called the directive principles of state policy which i will offer to you in my conclusion as the way forward a unique chapter of indian of the indian constitution unique perhaps to only two constitutions in the world the irish and the indian okay <coughs> so you have this crisis in education which i need not belabor you have a crisis of uh, the of the urban with the kind of migrations that are taking place as agriculture collapses in the countryside okay between the 91 census and the 2011 census 15 million farmers dropped out of agriculture that's at the rate of 2000 a day every day for 20 years you do the math 15 million 20 years more than 2000 maybe 2038 or 2040 something terrible is happening in your countryside and has been happening for a while that's why i am not only an alumnus of uh, loyola i am a very proud alumnus of the jawaharlal nehru university delhi and when invited there to do a teach in in 2017 after kanhaiya had been arrested by the police i said something to my younger generation there 
which i say to you here what's happening to you what's being done to you is terribly wrong and you should resist it and you're fighting and you're fighting on behalf of all of us but it's not new as i said welcome to the rest of india there are hundreds of millions of poor and marginalized people for whom this has been the norm this has been the life for many years not just kashmir you can take the northeast where we have had martial law for 60 years no rights no liberties no equalities no fraternities you can look at kashmir today the very arguments that were made for the arrest of all the very stories we were told after the dismissal of the government in kashmir that people have accepted it there's nothing wrong everything is calm nothing has happened and we arrested so and so because of this are the very excuses trotted out for attacks on liberties and rights everywhere else in the country now we have nationalized that trend the trend of 1949 november 30 that attacked the indian constitution now the uh you know when i said welcome to the rest of the country what was i talking about for decades now especially after 91 when we started grabbing the resources of the rural poor when we started forcibly acquiring land as we are doing in maharashtra till last year for the bullet train or some other grandiose project a bullet train between two cities uh, in which there are some 26 flights a day between those two cities yeah some 69 luxury buses ply that route every day and god knows how many train journeys are on that bus on that uh, mumbai gujarat route but we grab land for it F- since the mid 90s land grab for scz's for the super rich for the concentration of wealth in the name of trickle down theory and creating employment note this that all those scz's land was taken on the promise of employment not one job have you added to your economy not one job have you added to your economy hmm. so what was i saying i was saying i i was remembering andhra pradesh the anti port the new port in shrikakulam the anti port agitation all the agitators arrested with 20 30 40 cases against them one of them a 78 year old lady weighing less than 40 kilograms maybe 35 36 kilograms she is a 78 year old marginal farmer and laborer can't lift a sickle has 22 cases filed against her including attempt to murder a police party she is 78 years old at that time now she if she's alive she'll be in her late 80s so this was long before mr modi long before the nda government it was the logic of neoliberalism it was the logic of studied inequality constructed inequality so imagine how this woman would go and murder a police party posco in odisha jagat singhpur whenever i meet abai sahu the leader of the agitation my first question to him is how many and he says ah now about 59 cases okay 14 year old kids have cases against them 18 19 cases against them in the posco agitation which was successful and drove out posco kodankulam i think sp uday kumar had some 90 cases at one point some such absurd figure um odisha koraput where i spent a lot of time an agitation takes place and three, many people are in jail i go to the koraput jail to meet one of the he is a professor of chemistry 
the charges against him range from attempt to murder to theft of a buffalo so i asked the dgp of odisha what the heck you know he is waging war against the state and he finds the time to steal a buffalo i mean explain he said you don't understand sir you are all horrible fellows we know that the senior serious cases we put against them the minute they go to court the judge will throw those cases out at least in those days judges were still doing their job hmm uh he said we know that they'll throw out all the murder and conspiracy cases so we now ask so we keep a number of other things if i don't get you on one i'll get you on the other what it actually does is to reduce that person's life to every day every week trips to the court or the police station cripples them it just cripples them they have to go to the court or the police station where will they work nobody will give them a job if they have a job somewhere they have to drop out of it the jarika the jarikas husband and wife in kalinganagar 17 people shot dead for the great steel plant in kalinganagar the jarik ravi jarika and his wife adivasis educated bscs from katak university in their life they hadn't been to a police station now they don't go anywhere else between the two of them they have some 80 or 80 to 90 cases filed you know once and for dalits and adivasis do you think that the arrests and false false cases are something new and novel when i covered the kumher massacre a decade after the massacre had occurred in rajasthan not a single charge sheet had been filed not a single case had been framed and yet people were going about the people who had committed the massacre were going about and i asked i asked the uh, chunni lal jatav a dalit of the kumher village in my naivet 20 years ago i'm talking about in my naivet i said chunni lal ji what you're saying can't be possible i mean that's not how the law can work it cannot be this way it cannot be that way he listened to me with a great deal of strained patience and then he gave me the greatest court quote on law and justice in this country that i have ever received he told me sainat ji all the learned judges of the supreme court do not have the power of my local havaldar the learned judges interpret the law my policeman writes his own i said this 3 days ago and justice chelameshwar of the supreme court who was on the stage told me said aloud that is absolutely right that is absolutely true justice chelameshwar said that is absolutely true the lok our society reeks of impunity and arbitrariness i can do i do things because i can i punish you because i can so this there is that at every time whether it's an economic or a political or a social crisis it intersects with that crisis of our social composition and outlook of our caste system of our impunity and arrogant arbitrariness that by the way also influences all the data there is a crisis of data in this country most of you understand this that none of they they killed the data of the they have killed the data of the uh, national sample survey organization only the consumption data a little section has escaped from somewhere and paraded itself in some sections of the media there is there was a body called the national nutrition monitoring bureau in hyderabad in 2014 it came out with a report saying that people in the countryside were consuming less of most essential minerals magnesium milk most of it 
they were consuming less than the indian population had consumed per capita 40 years ago now the government how did it deal with this data it shut down the national nutrition monitoring bureau when the national crime records bureau started publishing in fact the statisticians of the national crime records bureau blame me for their woes because i was the guy who would every year write about what the numbers were on the farm suicide in august to in 2014 soon after coming to power and don't say again it's only them mr sharad pawar the great farmer leader had started this process of crudifying the upa did plenty of damage the nda is in these respects not on the social level but in the economic policy and other and in law policy you can say that the nda is the upa on steroids you know in fact mr arun shauri described the difference between the congress and the bjp saying the bjp is congress plus cow yeah and i would say on steroids both cow and the party now the kind of damage that the now look at the intent and what it has done why did they extend the cow slaughter ban they thought okay we will teach we will give a beating and teach a lesson to these wretched muslims that was the aim of the in maharashtra of extending the cow slaughter ban in new new methods new ways new clauses etc what did it eventually do hmm? oh yeah did it did it devastate the muslims of course it did and then it devastated the obcs it devastated the marathas it devastated the dalits more than anyone else why when you have people running the country who don't know the country and think it is one strip called the hindi belt hmm, you have an and urban small town people running the country who have no knowledge of the rural economy of the rural structures of the interdependence of all of us in maharashtra the yes muslims are the butchers the qureshis and others have that so the, they are visible immediately target them you targeted them then you know what happened the baikullah zoo for two weeks the lions and tigers were being fed on chicken television crews came from all over the world to watch lions and tigers eating chicken you know how many chicken you have to kill to feed one lion yeah it's a genocide of the avian world then uh, then the cattle markets collapsed normally you know you have a rural crisis when the cattle prices at the cattle markets fall 30% below normal that's what you are taught as an ias probationer in the masuri academy prices fell from salem to madurai to maharashtra prices fell 80% and more okay who were wiped out all the dalals who run the cattle markets most of whom overwhelmingly are obcs who were the affected farmers those who buy and sell cows the maratha farmers were smashed you go and talk to a farmer who's got 10 cows and ask him what are you doing in the middle of the drought he says i'm watching my cows die he says i don't have the water and the food for my family ask him why don't you go and sell it he says are you crazy those those crazies are out on the highway waiting to kill me if i come with there with a cow and then make in india something that was happening for 50 years before you heard of mr modi there was a beautiful product of make in india it was called the kolhapuri chappal wiped out wiped out by this that interdependent economy that interdependent society they understood nothing of it when they took these actions so you had a crisis of economy all over the country from uttarakhand to maharashtra 
people are taking their old cows and leaving them on the edge of the forest so you're providing free meat to the leopards and tigers but you know human beings are forbidden yeah. then you had so you have that crisis you have a crisis of demonetization my favorite thing on that is from karnataka you know chitradurga so there are two great things in chitradurga i mean three one is the religious matas one is the great chitra durga fort and one is a beautiful dosa joint now when i landed in chitra durga you know where i headed i have headed for the dosa joint this is one year anniversary it was the anniversary of demonetization i asked the all the restaurant was plastered with notices so i asked my fellow journalist so what does that say in kannada they said it says please do not produce 2000 rupee notes in this restaurant we will not accept yeah please tender exact change or smaller notes so i asked the manager proprietor sitting there i said demonetization was one year ago i say what why do you uh, why are you still having that notice he said sir we were affected very badly we lost 60% of revenue and i said yeah but i'm told you have recovered he said yeah i have recovered i said then why are you having six of these notices he said sir let it be who knows what they'll do next <laughs> so demonetization devastated all across your society indian agriculture 95 98% of your transactions are cash transactions you have then you put on the gst you create see it's become it's become very important the 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 constitutional crisis all of this fit into one gigantic crisis the crisis of inequality which is today greater than it has ever been in the world and if you and i don't take that crisis seriously and as ambedkar said don't look at it just in terms of the politics look at it in terms of the economics and look at it in terms of the social yes the same framework of inequality affects dalits and adivasis far worse than it does you and me or those of us who are not dalits and adivasis here is oxfam's latest numbers on global inequality and you will see what a gender face what a regional face what a political face what a caste face it has hmm. the richest in 2019 the richest 22 men in the world the richest 22 what is the world's population 7.57 billion the richest 22 men in the world have more wealth than all the women in africa how many women are there in africa 650 million 650 million women there are in africa and 22 of the world's richest men if you think that's an obscene figure try this oxfam's economist made a calculation suppose you are let's say a little elderly about 5000 years old and you have been living since the time of the pyramids of ancient egypt okay how many years ago was that 5000 years if you had been living since the pyramids of ancient egypt maybe you were a pharaoh immortal and you saved 10000 every day of those 5000 years you saved 10000 uh it would still amount to one fifth of the average wealth of the five richest men in the world it would still amount to one fifth of the average wealth of the five richest men in the world that's it now please understand and all of us here particularly men should reflect on the fact 
how much of this inequality is constructed on the backs of women oxfam found that women and girls you know the big deal in india is about unpaid work we show women's work participation falling because we don't count what women do as work we don't count the work they do at home as work we don't count the tending of the fields of the cattle of the livestock we don't count that as work that's her bloody job as a woman right if and that's why if if you started calculating the work women do financially that could well you, you would see what a share of your gross domestic product that would take oxfam worldwide every single day i'm talking about every 24 hours women and girls have unpaid work the hour you know how many hours of unpaid work anyone would like to guess how many hours of unpaid care work unpaid work looking after others care work how many hours of unpaid work do women and girls across the world do in a single day every day 12.5 billion hours 12.5 billion hours across the globe you know how much that is in monetary value done at minimum wages 10.8 trillion dollars a year which is three times the size of the global tech industry the combined global tech industry is worth one third of the number of hours of unpaid labor that women and girls do across this planet incidentally the other crisis that come up we have an extremely serious crisis of climate women and girls are disproportionately victims of the climate crisis undp calculates that 80% of those devastated by climate change are women 80% of the brunt is taken by women now in india they calculated that in just one year in 12 months 2017 18 indian billionaires increased their wealth in 12 months by 4891 billion rupees you know how much 4891 billion rupees is it's enough to take care just the increase not the wealth just the increase is enough to take care of 80% of all the health and education budgets of your 28 states and nine union territories another form of now this is a calculation from a pro people organization let's take the calculations and data of the other side those who believe that inequality is a good thing let's take forbes magazine you all heard of forbes it's the oracle of global capitalism Forbes every year puts out a list of billionaires nationwide hmm. and in its list of billionaires it says you know each country how many how much did they add last year how much did they lose last year and there's a ranking in 1990 before the in 1991 when the economic reforms began india did not have a single dollar billionaire unless there were a couple of very modest people tucked away somewhere we didn't have a single dollar billionaire by year 2000 we had eight by year 2012 which is the year we began our socio economic caste census by 2012 we had 53 and in 2018 we had 121 dollar billionaires and those 121 121 individuals those 121 guys sorry girls they mostly guys uh those 121 though by the way i have to tell you that forbes every year <coughs> publishes its global billionaires list on march 8th international women's day maybe maybe it's an aspirational thing you can also hope 
you know you can also dream of it there are a few there are a couple from india but that is the joint inherited family wealth though those 121 individuals in a population of 130 crores accounted for 100 accounted for 22% of your gross domestic product giving that whole other meaning to the word gross hmm. 22 individuals you have concentrated that kind of wealth what about the other end of the spectrum that ambedkar spoke about what was that other end of the spectrum the socio economic caste census showed us 75% of rural households how many rural households are there 179 million in the 2011 census 75% of your rural households the main breadwinner took home less than 5000 rupees a month okay less than 5000 rupees a month if you raise the benchmark to 10000 it's 90% of rural households take home have a breadwinner who takes home less than 10000 a month how many families take home the main breadwinner takes home more than 10000 8% take home more than 10000 again this has a caste face 8% is the national average of rural families where the main breadwinner takes home more than 10000 but if we break it up into dalits adivasis and others dalits and adivasis it's less than 4% now who are the dalits and adivasis who earn more than 10000 government servants okay a, cup, a few primary school teachers pwd workers highway workers clerks in the chaprasis in the uh, collectorate's office and those are the jobs which we are shutting down the public sector jobs the factories 2 million jobs have gone since the 1991 brave new world of neoliberalism began 2 million jobs now in the last in the last few years a new crisis has caught up with you remember we have we have a tendency to romanticize anything that comes along internet is going to liberate everybody social media is freedom of expression for god sake give me a break and yeah and uh so one of it industry india's it industry which delivered automation in all other industries in 2017 automation came to the it industry which laid off top 7 companies laid off 56000 people so where were all your jobs to be created the top 7 companies did they lose did they lay it off because they were making losses rubbish those 7 companies had pre tax profits your infosys tcs they had pre tax profits of 23000 crores they laid off 56000 people on what basis did they lay off those 56000 on merit rubbish that means this that means the leaders of these companies have no merit or intellect at all because they laid off all the people who had worked 15 years for the company it took you 15 years to find out that they are not good you're a bunch of idiots i mean you have to be a moron if you can't notice that in 15 years it took you 15 years to know that the person isn't good enough no they threw out people of a particular earning category to heighten the profits of their shareholders they threw off all those in that 2 lakh 150000 2 lakh rupees bracket 2 lakhs and more bracket because it saved them crores of rupees to give their top 1% of shareholders so now the it industry is laying off people in large ways and is not the next phase by the way automation let me talk to you about that one line next time girls and guys you go and use your atm card huh that atm card that machine that dumb machine in which you put your atm card 10 years ago it was 15 jobs 
it was 15 jobs in the bank. Please ask the Bank Employees Association. 60% of the front-end operations of the banks are now done by automation. On top of that, we are going to have the new wave of artificial intelligence. There isn't even going to be a pretense of job creation. You are destroying millions of livelihoods. I said this crisis is now national. It's gripped the whole and the soul of this country. Okay? There's no chance for, of getting out of that trap unless you change your direction completely. On the other hand, the billionaires, one of those billionaires, the most famous of them, of those 121, was, is so rich that he was richer than number two and number three put together. And Mukesh Bhai, in, in 12 months of 2017-18, added $16.9 billion to his wealth. Boy, imagine how hard he must have worked. Yeah. Or was it the result of little shifts in policy to favor Geo and allow you to murder all your telecom rivals by policy? Yeah. I wake up one morning and find the Prime Minister of the country on the front page of every advertisement, front page of every newspaper in the country selling Geo. Congratulations. By the way, that's a violation of the con it's a violation of Indian law. There is a law called Law of Emblems and Symbols. The National Act of Emblems and Symbols. I cannot use your photo or this without and if you are President, Prime Minister, Governor, Chief Minister, Vice President, Speaker of the Assembly, CMs and all these people. Okay? I can only use it if I have your permission. If he had the permission, then that's the first time in our country a Prime Minister is hawking private products. Geo and Mr. Modi. So I wrote that day that I think now, you know, I, I feel we should change the national salutation. Jai Hind is passe. Geo Hind. BSNL is being slaughtered to be handed over to them. BSNL is being slaughtered for that purpose. The only bloody carrier who works in the rural areas. So all these things come together. Your crisis is exploding. Five years, cow slaughter bans, mob lynchings, aflaq khans, terror attacks. In the, class, in, the, in the close, let me put together two things for you. Where we are and where we need to go. A month ago, I was interviewing one of the projects we are doing in the People's Archive of Rural India. And if you find anyone in Bangalore, I want to meet her or him. We are interviewing India's last living freedom fighters. In Chennai, I met R. Nallakanne and N. Sankaraya, age 96 and 99. And when we told them, what about the situation today? You don't seem perturbed. These old gentlemen said, huh? We've seen worse. This too shall pass. We've seen worse. They fought worse. Yeah. Pressures will come. Look. <clears throat> if you are doing challenging journalism, you will be challenged. Understand that. If you are doing challenging journalism, you will be challenged. I have got from one of these, one of the country's great zooming industrialists, a legal, legal threat for something we wrote on. We are going ahead with the story. We are going to do a second story. Okay? So, you, you, you have to fight that out. But, please understand what your strength as an individual is not a fraction of your strength as a collective. You have to rebuild fraternity. You have to rebuild the coming to the rescue of the others. You have to rebuild Unions, associations, sangatans. The destruction of the unions in the 80s by Mr. Samir Jain and co. Hmm. Mr. Jain said, journalism is a business like any other business. Toothpaste, tea, whatever. He was absolutely wrong as I told him then and I've always said. Newspapers are a business. Channels are a business. Stations are a business. Portals are a business. 
journalism is not a business journalism is a calling especially in the indian tradition gandhi to bhagat singh very different people very different streams of very different streams of the freedom struggle but these were your journalists you know so they they stood up to pressures and they showed us how to stand up to pressures you build your journalist union you be a member of the union that gives you the strength where people are not able to victimize you one two things corporations did when they took over journalism they smashed the unions and brought the law of contract employment contract employment is for 11 months in the 8th month you know somebody whose mother is in the hospital in the icu one child is looking for education loan to go abroad two kids are just completing co- college one is applying to college or one of them is applying to college and you are called by the boss 90 days before renewal of your contract and say okay we are backing this party and you will write this stuff and it will go under your name praising this man to the skies as one of them asked me as one of those journalists asked me do you want me to be a hero when there was a working journalist act to protect us we could fight this now these guys have killed the working journalist act the supreme court has thrashed them for not implementing the working journalist act and the wage board they don't care they don't care for the supreme court of india that and that brings me to your question about solutions one is absolutely destroy monopoly control of anything especially journalism especially health education if you have monopolies are based on the issue of what are the bottom line is the bottom line they are therefore when a, when a corporation takes over journalism what is its philosophy journalism is one more revenue stream right it's got to make money so that's why rural india gets 0.67% of the front page of the average national daily okay because it doesn't make the money it doesn't buy the products of their advertisers yeah it can't buy their santros and their bmws so you you cover i cover you if i make money out of covering you that's why bollywood bollywood gets so much attention and the suicide of a tragic suicide of a young female model in mumbai got three pages which was in 2006 which was more than the suicides of 3000 farmers that year had got one makes money for them it sells a lifestyle it sells an idea it sells an aspiration the other doesn't make that money for them monopoly over information and ideas you are controlling look a large number of those farmers who used very wretched bad seeds who were the brand ambassadors who sold them that seeds icons of bollywood who appear in their living room on the television every evening in some tv serial telling them use bolgard it's going to change your life it did it ended their lives also yeah you cannot have monopoly and one of the first paragraph of the introduction to the directive principles of state policy says that for equality the material resources of the community shall not be used for the benefit of the few it is a, your constitution is explicitly anti monopoly and since 91 we have built encouraged cheered and celebrated monopoly and how great this guy is how great that guy is and some of those great guys now we are looking for them abroad the enforcement directorate wants them when you know when i came to karnataka once before to the iim everybody in journalism asked this question and it's a legitimate question uh, it's a legitimate question sir what is your revenue model now i don't have one but the understanding is you must have a revenue model in place to do journalism i don't agree gandhi didn't have one ambedkar didn't have one bhagat singh didn't have one they had journalism and they struggled to get it published you know the i tell me 
if revenue model venture capitalist approval if these are what the base you have already lost the battle if valmiki had to get the approval of the cas of a venture capitalist for writing the ramayana what sort of an ending would the ramayana have had if shakespeare had to get a vc's approval to write romeo and juliet could it have had a tragic ending tragedies don't make money that's what the film industry will tell you do you know that walt disney has read it has has an animated film hunchback of notre dame it has a happy ending the classic hunchback of notre dame a classic of european literature has now a happy ending because tragedies you know you're you're approaching children let's give them fun not tragedies so if you don't fight monopoly i agree this thing with journalism students sitting here how you raise money is a problem i hope to raise money from all of you but on random donations but revenue model the business guys of iim asked me sir what is you have to explain what your revenue model is i said i don't have one but there are two which i admire and both of them are from karnataka one was veerappan and the other vijay malya what revenue models veerappan ran his revenue model for 40 years most inclusive model from the forest guard to the forest minister everybody was on the take and vijay malya okay sitting with 9000 10000 crores of your money and mine in a flat in mayfair in london Ooh. i think that the i i think that journalism is an idealistic occupation it's a calling yeah you have to make you have to make you you have to there, there is no option but that you will struggle you have to make compromises you have to make compromises but you have to understand the distinction between a compromise and a sell out you have to make that distinction between a compromise and a sell out between selling your labor and selling your soul when you are an intern you know what you should do when you are an intern shut up and do what you are told <laughs> okay i need you to survive survival is the first so when you are an intern first year you know if you get and as this situation will not change as long as a handful of people control the media the richest man in the country who added 16.9 billion dollars in a year is also the biggest owner of media in india you know your kannada etv etv kannada etv marathi they are not owned by ramoji rao of inadu tv except for the telugu channels they are all today owned by mukesh bhai or some front organization some trust i love it they call it the independent media trust or something yeah what a brilliant nomenclature so that that is the thing you cannot fight monopoly in the 60s in the 60s there were huge anti monopoly battles and that's how and that is how the ending of monopolies and the giant public sector and the creation of millions of jobs all that happened but that's another conversation also the consequences of the new education policy national education policy where do i start and it isn't just for rural india hmm? the very understanding of liberal arts i mean look at what it says it says these liberal arts and humanities it equates to 64 kalas of ancient india you know in in the old indian uh, texts you have listing of occupations and crafts and the 64 kalas which are listed the guys who go and put this in the policy have they read to the list of kalas do you know two of the do you know what are two of the kalas in those 64 anyone wants to guess what are the extraordinary kalas which are the liberal arts referred to as the shape of liberal arts in our new policy 
the colors include carpentry you know one more thing they include theft they were listing occupations they were listing occupations they were whoever did that listing did an honest listing okay on a rational basis i didn't see anyone flying chariots in the colors by the way i was trained as a historian not as a journalist yeah both in loyola and in jnu so the colors do not include fantasies they are talking about i mean this is your liberal arts you know i guess we do have a lot of theft in the liberal arts in plagiarism and stuff but i didn't know that it's an occupation and a, and an art in itself or a humanity in itself the consequences of that are going to be further privatization and further exclusion of marginalized people from access to a good education in the latest budget you've seen they have they are handing over district level hospitals to private players and the biggest cause of bankruptcy in farmers is health expenditures in the rural india is health expenditures in 2016 the public health foundation of india headed by dr shrinath reddy of which amartya sen was one of the founding trustees told us that 55 million indians had fallen below the poverty line because of health expenditures in 2018 that was 36 million indians being pushed to bpl because of health expenditures now if you're going to do the same with education great government schools and institutions will be handed over to private you know i love it when i hear people in iit and iim railing against subsidies these are the most food secure creatures on the planet okay they are the most subsidized people in this country in the field of education the students of iim and iit yeah and they want to say don't you think we should privatize do you think how many of those great guys in silicon valley would have been in any valley would they have made it to rishi valley if they had if they had had to go through private education fee charging capitation fee demanding education where would they have gone would they have gone further than silent valley of kerala so this kind of the consequences are going to be uh, your 2011 says census says 400 million indians have not seen the inside uh, of a an educational institution right and the attitude even before the policy was enunciated was shown to you in the attitude surrounding the tragic suicide of rohit vemula yeah what a, what a, the kind of, what did they say they said their great point was he is not a dalit now who certifies whether you are a dalit or a your caste certificate that is done by the tehsildar and it is done if in case of a dispute by the collector the tehsildar and the collector both certified that rohit vemula was a dalit so they brought in a retired judge who knows nothing about andhra pradesh nothing about guntur nothing about rohit vemula who said he was not a dalit okay i mean you have you you're going to see the now you have what you're doing in the education policy is making sure you don't have a rohit vemula problem because they're not going to enter the portals of an educational institution you're doing away with the problem by doing away with vemula that's what you're doing so that's the issue with the education policy yeah. we have uh, time for one last question anybody would want i saw that hand first at the end of nero's guess uh, a question was raised to you wherein uh, the journalist or the person in question said they were not aware of the issue and you made the remark i think i'm paraphrasing welcome to the club there are a billion people who are not aware my question is when we go out and spread and educate this billion people majority of whom are already blinded by the false narratives that are in place by our private media what are the practical steps we must keep in mind and execute 
while educating these individuals. Because today, the so-called urban debates and other debates have already brainwashed the narratives and WhatsApp University has given ample, almost rote learned facts as so-called responses. What are the practical measures and patient measures we must take to combat these narratives, delegitimize them, and give them the so-called truth, if it even exists? One of the first things you need to do is to end the romanticization of technology and techno-managerial solutions to everything. Hmm. The, you know, when the internet came, how excited everybody was, it's going to liberate everybody. You know, if I go back in history, with Gutenberg, we expected the education, you know, the, the learning would spread across the world. Though, by the way, there was a printing press in a place called China about 1,000 years before Gutenberg. Hmm. A moving type. Anyway, but we thought with Gutenberg comes enlightenment. Yeah. What did you get? Hmm. Yeah. You got in in what were the, what were some of the great books you got? Initially, you ran onto the Bible that made it the highest selling thing and, and at another end of the spectrum you got the biggest selling book in Europe in the 30s, Mein Kampf. Hmm. Then came radio. Okay, radio was going to be, the, Raymond Williams, the sociologist, said that radio would liberate the masses. Indeed, it showed every promise of doing so. The 1920s United States was I think a paradise of broadcasting. Everybody had a radio station. Every union, teachers union of Connecticut had its radio station. Every church had its radio station. Everybody had little. And what comes in my dear friend? Monopoly. All those are wrecked and three companies control now two. Clear channel and that other thing. Control radio across the United States. Then, we thought radio broadcast, Raymond Williams said, you know, would uh, liberate the masses. The biggest use of the radio broadcast after he said that were Hitler's Berlin broadcasts into Prague, into Czechoslovakia and Poland. The thing is that, you know, stop romancing the technology and ignoring the political class hierarchies that control the technology. That is a, a, a very ridiculous state of things. So that's the first. Stop romancing tech and stop. I am a terrible techno geek. I love gadgets. And, okay. I don't think that I am substituting. I'm, I'm not for substituting my own intelligence with them. I also learned to hate them at many levels. So, um, the other thing, again, you know, a lot of people imagine that because internet came, it was not monopolized by Murdoch or so and so. It's a very free place. Please know these two fundamental things, realities about the internet. Internet guarantees you, the internet guarantees you a voice. It doesn't guarantee you that anyone will listen to it. Okay? That it doesn't do. Who, who has that capability? The same monopolies who control newspapers, channels, TV, radios, digital. The same. Jeff Bezos of Amazon owns Washington Post. The internet is the most monopolized of all media in the world today. Five guys, it used to be seven, until, you know, YouTube got taken over by one guy and Instagram got taken over by another guy. Now it's down to about five companies that really control. Yeah, there are little spaces amongst those where people like us play. Yeah, but we, are, we play there very conscious of the fact that we are fighting for space all the time and it brings you back 
break monopoly today the united states is seriously faced with the challenge of breaking google's monopoly europe has already taken very serious action against microsoft and google billions of dollars of fines for their monopolizing the market with unfair means because they have the means they have the power okay they have that power so you need what do you need to go towards what do you need to work towards you need to work towards a democratization of the digital a democratization of media then you are building and feeding into a larger democratization of your democracy itself now uh, what are the other things you know one of the other things that slogans that ambedkar gave you applies to your question what to do you remember the slogan he gave educate organize agitate that was yeah there were other slogans from others too which i think are very fine but that is appropriate for your your question i think he said educate organize agitate and he said do so always only only by constitutional means that he emphasizes that several times in his last years he understood the frailty of the constitution and yet said this he critiqued the constitution and yet said this okay so see nero's guess what they were asking me was you know i'm confu- that girl was saying i'm confused i said join the club it's got 900 you know million others no it's got a billion other people there's nothing wrong with being confused hmm. the people whom we are fighting today they're not confused they have great clarity they know what they want they're going to destroy institutions and they're setting about it and they're largely successful so far in what they've done they've met some reverses in the last few months that's a, that's a, so that battle goes on you draw clarity from i think that you cannot fight fundamentalism with fundamentalism you cannot find obscurantism with your own brand of obscurantism you find you fight irrationality with rationality yeah so what do you tell your students i'm saying i think that what you need to do is to get your students to first learn about their own history their own you know their own society i teach journalism now for more than 30 years each year i'm finding as i tell my old history professor my old history professors include romila tapar bipin chandra as i tell her every year i'm teaching more history than journalism because if the kids don't know who this person was who that was what that was remember those two f- how many of you knew of those two fundamental contending views how many of you knew of that editorial in the organizer which said kill this bloody constitution it's all nonsense yeah you need to know you need to know why a bhagat singh died you need to know why gandhi did whatever he did you need to know that if you don't know that you know there is a there's that beautiful saying in a terrible context of an ancient chinese general but we can borrow it out of context know the enemy and 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 murder the f- phrasing a little bit know the enemy a hundred battles a hundred victories know thyself a thousand battles a thousand victories thank you